Did you see Tyler's article about dolphins? I, I, I opened it, but I haven't had a chance to um, to read it. I saw that they gave themselves names, though, which I enjoy. It had really? dialects. Yeah. That's cool. I haven't read it either, but I really enjoyed the article. Or the, um, the headline. Headline. <laughs> the headline. The headline was expertly written. I've been having problems with the, the headline from, from this week, um, just saying it, it wants to morph into other words in my mouth. The, the fish evictions. The fish. Fish evictions? Fi- fish, fish evictions. <laughs> fish evictions. Fish evictions. Fish? Fish fictions. Fish fictions. <laughs> <laughs> A tasty treat. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Pod Keep Our Land. Sorry for the delay in getting this episode out to you. I know I said I'd be able to get it out to you earlier this week, but I have been road tripping with some of the law bros and have been out of communication uh, and out of reach of my computer for the last couple of days. Nevertheless, I hope you enjoy this episode. I think it's a lot of fun. And in particular, I hope you have a good time listening to my interview with Hector Bremner. It's my first try at an interview, so I hope it went well. We're also going to be covering some changes that the end he has made to the Legislative Drafting Office, the results of the Vancouver by-election, and the eviction or potential eviction of fish farms by the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, please let me know what you think. Without further ado, on with the show. I w- we wanted to just mention uh, something that the NDP government mm-hmm. in BC um, has decided to do in terms of drafting legislation. Can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. The NDP government has made legislative drafting services available to the opposition party or opposition party and crutch party, whatever the greens are. Um, <laughs> and they, uh, th- this is actually like, I am a big believer in the parliamentary process and legislating. And now that um, most of the parliament isn't a lawyer, like there, there used to be a time when most politicians were lawyers. Right. And like 90% of them were lawyers of some flavor. Sure. Uh, and if you are a lawyer, you have a little bit of uh, better grasp on how legislation works and uh, now that we have a much more diverse parliament uh, the training to write legislation isn't something that say a project engineer or a graphic designer or, or a berry farmer or a berry farmer uh, have the capability to do because it is it's an art legislative drafting is an art um, but it's like one of those very technical arts that require you to know exactly how much ochre to mix into the oil to create the perfect amount of red paint that won't dissolve the canvas or whatever. I don't understand how art works. And <laughs> I was I was really on this I was really going there for a little bit. And I'm like, I know ochre, it's red. I don't know cinnabon. Anyway, uh, lapis lazuli is yes. in blue paints. Do not legislate anything that will dissolve the <laughs> rule of law. <laughs> is well, the yeah. rule of law the canvas here? Uh, yeah, you know what? I think I think we're salvaging the metaphor. <laughs> The rule of law is the canvas. Don't dissolve the rule of law. And private members' bills, if they're not brought in in a way that, or, or opposition bills, if they're not brought in in a way that uh, has enjoyed the benefit of legislative drafting, um, are going to be crappy and also possibly, if not probably, unconstitutional or contradictory of another law. Yeah, so a, a great move. It is a great move. For and, everyone. And, like, I applaud the NDP government for doing it. Uh, I think the Liberals should take as much advantage of this as possible to draft a clear and coherent alternative to uh, the government and also to try and work with the Greens on the issues that the Greens and the Liberals agree with to pass um, pass legislation over the head of the government because that is a possibility. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, now, now that the, the, the two sides are almost evenly matched, mm-hmm. almost anybody, if you, if, you can, if you can get a free vote in the House, mm-hmm. you could get a private bill, a private member's bill passed which has been almost impossible for the last, what, 12 years? There's yep. only been, like, one or two that actually got got passed. Yeah, and, like, I, I, one of them was the, the ban on heels. Oh, right, right. Ban on mandatory yeah, yeah. heels uh-huh. uh, in restaurants, which was an Andrew Weaver bill, and, and also possibly Christy Clark trying to court mm. the green support after the next election. Really turned out well for her there. Uh, and, um, yeah, the, there have been a couple of private bills that have passed, which is different from private members' bills and private bills 
parallels are um, ones pertaining to individual societies that uh, for some reason or another couldn't get through the registrar of companies route to change important bylaws or, or whatever and so they're having the parliament come in and just amend their bylaws for them ah interesting yeah can I just say like lawyers are awesome but I'm so happy at like the diversity of backgrounds that the BC government has and or the, the, the BC legislature has and has had for a long time I, mm-hmm. I think it's it's just so wonderful to just look at all the different um, MLAs that we have in BC and all their different backgrounds and to, and to know that, that any career can take you to represent your constituency. Mm-hmm. Well, there should our... still be a couple lawyers. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Lawyers around the table <laughs> yeah. play a role for sure. But like the graphic designers and the bus drivers and the social workers and the teachers and farmers, th- th- that also brings a lot of really important perspective. And mm-hmm. I, I think our democracy is better for it. Yeah. I, I Like we've had um, attorney, we've had attorneys general or att- we've had an attorney general uh, who wasn't a lawyer, which is kind of unheard of. And then we went back having them be lawyers. But uh, I think that she, Shirley Bond, did a very good job as Minister of Justice. And um, it, it shows that like it, it would be interesting to have lawyers uh, not necessarily fill that role all the time, provided that someone of appropriate competence uh, is there for it and have, you know, the drafting of legal, uh, you know, someone who, that, some ministry that requires legal expertise or some committee that requires it have, have them open to going on to that one because there is a, a very small amount of lawyers in the House right now, like four, five. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Which is unusual in a parliamentary system. Yeah. yeah. So, so shall we t- change courses here? We, we, uh, we also got a bit of news this week regarding the by-election here in the city of Vancouver. Yes, uh, we elected Hector Bremner of the NPA. Uh, turnout was 10.99%. Which is bad. Yeah. Speaking of things that are not so good for democracy. But not super terrible for a by-election. Sure. Yeah. At, at the municipal level. Yeah. yeah. There was a by-election when I was grow- growing up in Calgary where 98% of people didn't vote. Wow. Yeah. It was the... the wow. The provincial government had fired the school boards, uh-huh. uh, and there was a, an election to fill the school boards, and people were like, nope, we refuse. <laughs> <laughs> whoever, I don't know, just put whoever on. Jeez. <laughs> So, so Bremner won the councillor spot. Yes, and interestingly, and I think this is uh, perhaps even more of a story, the Vision Vancouver candidate, Diego Cardona, uh, got fifth, which after the two socialist candidates, Gene Swanson and Judy Graves, uh, Gene Swanson coming in second, Judy Graves coming in fourth, and Pete Fry of the Green Party, uh, with, you know, basically a, a very paltry 5,411 votes compared to Victor Bremner's, uh, the Victor Hector Bremner uh, 13,372 uh, I don't know what this means for Vision but I don't think it means very good things mm. I think that it's possible that they might be in trouble in the next municipal election then again this may be a self-selection issue for the people who come out to buy elections mm-hmm. um Vision won three of the seats on the school board, although the top three vote-getters were uh, all Green Party of candidates. Mm. There were two NPAs and one one-city candidate who were also elected, filling out the uh, suite of nine, mm-hmm. uh, which means that it, it is quite possible that Janet Fraser could become the new chair of the Vancouver School Board if she gets support from uh, the NPA and or one city. Mm-hmm. So just looking at these numbers here, it's pretty clear that the, that the different candidates on the left split the vote and leaving at the NPA candidate at the councillor level winning with something like 23%? Uh, 23 percent of the vote, yes. Uh, which is not great for democracy, but... Um, it's the way it goes it's when it first passed the post system. It is. System. The thing that I find particularly interesting is that had Gene Swanson and Judy Graves not both been running, I'm pretty sure a like far-left socialist would have been elected to city council, uh, which would be as interesting as having mm-hmm. Hector... Digi- uh, Hector, Geno- Hector Bremner and Melissa De Genova there. Right, right. Uh, but I like that the NPA appears to be renewing itself, electing younger candidates. Um, and, you know, it, it is quite possible that the center will collapse in the next election. If, if Vision doesn't show what its particular plans are for fixing the crises that bedraggle this city. And we're going to hear your conversation
conversation with uh, Hector Bremner later in this episode. Yes, uh, we I'm sure we'll have a very in- interesting conversation when I sit down with him tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Trust me, it's going to be great. Yeah. <clears throat> Matthew, I grew up here on, in BC. You grew up in Alberta. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much you know about salmon, but I know a lot of things about salmon. I uh, used to be a fishmonger. You used to be a fishmonger, of course. So you know many things about salmon. I know that the PLU for salmon was uh, 3472. You still know that? It was burned into my mind <laughs> working at the totally unsuccessful fish counter in the Sobeys, Sobeys Royal Oak, where I arranged the fish on a bed of ice. Mm-hmm. And I learned how to fillet a halibut after the store manager came and yelled at me after the first time that I was trying to do this. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm being trained. What are you, not going to be perfect. Jeez. I don't know if I ever told you this, but I was a uh, camp counselor at an outdoor school mm-hmm. where we had a fish hatchery. And oh, cool. so we uh, we taught the kids about salmon life cycle and we involved them in the, um, the fertilization of the eggs. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So we'd like get their hands in the bucket with the eggs, like mixing it all up so that the, the eggs would get fertilized and mm-hmm. um, teach them all about like the, the salmon life cycle here on the Pacific Coast. It's a really important part of BC culture and has been for thousands and thousands of years, of course. Mm-hmm. I uh, I find salmon eggs delicious. They are my favorite type of sushi. <laughs> okay. Like little rubbery balls of salt. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, and, and also, um, they... Um, and also, the, the trade networks of indigenous people in uh, BC and Alberta were very, very heavily influenced by the Yulikon oil trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that trade created a trail network that Alexander Mackenzie used to, to be the first European to cross North America north of the Rio Grande in 1793. Whoa. So, fish. Fish. Important. Fish are important. Matthew, there are two kinds of salmon here in BC. There are wild Pacific salmon, which are are native to the BC coast, mm-hmm. and there are Atlantic farmed salmon. Mm-hmm. So farmed Atlantic salmon are not native, like I said, to mm-hmm. the BC coast. Mm-hmm. Um, however, they're also not migratory. So that means that you can raise them in pens in the ocean and harvest them much more efficiently than wild salmon that need to go back to the streams where they spawned mm-hmm. um, and and spawn again and, um, and 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 lay their new eggs. Right. So uh, Atlantic salmon very efficient. You can harvest them. You can make lots of fish. Um, now, most of BC's farm uh, farm salmon operators use large floating open net cage pens in the ocean where they where the fish can swim in the ocean water but not escape. And you can raise farm salmon on land in containers, but this is much, much, much more expensive. Hmm. And there's lots of evidence that shows that farm salmon raised in ocean pens can put wild stocks of Pacific salmon at risk by transferring parasites and disease through the net cages. And they can also escape in disrupt the, the spawning cycle of, um, of wild Pacific salmon. So for many years, environmentalists, First Nations, and other groups have called for stricter rules on, um, on farmed salmon, or even the banning of open net uh, fish farming. Um, but we haven't really seen a lot of change on that until now. Um, BC Minister of Agriculture just sent a letter to some fish farms. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that letter? Yes. So Lana Popham is the Minister of Agriculture, and she sent what was described somewhat bizarrely in the news article is a chilling letter which you know normally chilling means like suppression of speech uh, but I think it just means spooky letter uh, to a fish farm operator saying that uh, the expansion of fish farms and the actual existence of fish farms is subject to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, and that they should be aware that regulatory actions and such and such may be coming down the pipeline which um, they also oppose the construction but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, <laughs> nice metaphor. <laughs> okay, so Fish Farm got this letter. Is it just one farm? Yeah, the operator in question was a company called Marine Harvest Canada. Um, and, and there is a lot of fish farming. And, like, fish farming is very economically important to British Columbia. Absolutely. Um, there are, particularly in the Campbell River Comox region of Vancouver Island, uh-huh. uh, there are many, many people that are involved in fish farms. And those fish farms uh, tend to spend money in the local area. They're incredibly important for the local economy, uh, mm-hmm. and they provide fish that we eat, which uh, is very important because uh, like fish farming and aquaculture play a very essential role in supplying enough fish for us to consume. Uh, 
if, if we didn't have these fish, I think we would have a lot bigger problem in terms of trying to meet the demand for it, and, and it would cause overfishing. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's lots of different factors at play here. There's you know we're concerns about nutrition for British Columbians and concerns around the economics of providing uh, employment opportunities in some of these more remote areas. Um, there's right. also the environmental side of things. And, and indigenous and, rights. And, and indigenous rights, right. Uh, and, and this stems from the uh, the duty to consult and the responsibility of uh, governments and companies to ensure that they have consulted and, you know, whether or not strict approval or veto power exists is somewhat unclear. This is an evolving area of jurisprudence, although the, the Supreme Court has already said that there is no absolute veto that uh, First Nations have over development, but that there is a duty to consult. Um, the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations, Perry Bellegard, has said, uh, and I quote, the Declaration gives indigenous people the right to say yes and the right to say no that is a question that is somewhat up for debate but um, because I, I think that there is a greater case to be made for that on the water than there is on land because it's much harder to draw borders in the water mm, mm -hmm. so um, there is, is a much more interconnected or I mean all the ecosystems are inter interconnected naturally but uh, it's harder to draw that clear line when that line is a net Right, right. And fish don't care about boards. No, they do not. As much as dolphins we try to teach might. them. Dolphins, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they've... Well, it's their lack of opposable thumbs has prevented them from taking over the world. But they are, have different languages. They have, you know, they might have borders. I'm sure they, they have territories. Oh, so I don't... Yeah. I don't I, I'd be interested in reading a history of the dolphin wars and, you know, in the mm -hmm. Dalish Sea. Yeah, I mean, that's... Yeah, that's a fair point. Maybe fish have their own borders and it's not aware of them. Mm -hmm. But they don't line up with our borders, which no. is, uh, no matter how many times we show them the maps. <laughs> right. Stop here. <laughs> International waters is a hundred meters from shore. <laughs> That's, that's Matthew playing the fish in this in this little sketch for yeah. you. <laughs> really, really good demonstration for this radio program. <laughs> okay, okay. So Canada signed on at last to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Yes. Last year, 2016. Yes. It's been around for quite a bit longer than that, and Canada was one of the few countries that hadn't signed on. Yes. And we finally have. And mm -hmm. so now is this sort of like a, one of the sort of cascading actions that has to take place? as a result of that um, um, that move? Possibly. Uh, it, again, with many of these things, it's not clear. As with all international law, uh, all international conventions, it has to be enacted into Canadian law in order to come into force in Canada. Right, right. Um, and we can't really wholesale import uh, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, like, clause for clause, because... For one, many of them are statements of principle, mm -hmm. uh, and it does not tell us how we would go about doing that, uh, and so it's just not enough there. Uh, and two, it, it needs to be finessed so that it is constitutional, because we can't have unconstitutional legislation. So those two things uh, will be done over the next couple of years, theoretically, by some collaboration between the courts and um, the various provincial and federal levels of government. Mm -hmm. So um, at the provincial level, new NDP government has has committed to to what uh, enacting or, or ratifying or what, what do you say on the provincial level when they're when they're becoming consistent with um, this UN declaration? I'm going to say walking the walk. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I, they, they are they're committed to the principles. Mm -hmm. um, they they say the government is fully adopt uh, will be fully adopting and implementing uh, UNDRAP. Um, which, as a statement, means not exactly all that much to me because how they will be implementing it is very up in the air. She continues, as minister, you are, or rather, this is uh, Horgan's uh, Horgan's Man mandate letter to Lana Popham. As minister, you are responsible for reviewing policies, programs, and legislation to determine how to bring the principles of the Declaration into action in British Columbia. This is basically saying that Marine Harvest Canada has to establish a healthy working relationship with the fish farm. Uh, sorry, with the with the uh, indigenous uh, bands in the area, um, that uh, it's not very clear 
exactly what mm -hmm. those obligations are. Uh, as it stands, the groups in the area want fish farms removed. Right. Um, a wholesale removal of fish farms everywhere, I think, would be a catastrophe for um, our food supply uh, and more tangentially for the salmon stocks of our wild salmon. But we've got, got a problem because the, this does need to be enacted and there needs to be a constructive way of that to be brought about that like, helps Indigenous groups be comfortable with it, that uh, continues the food supply, that uh, protects the environment, uh, and that keeps um, keeps our obligations under international law. And Van Apopham has kind of thrown some mud in the water here as to what exactly that, that means, but I think it's probably good that she has done so because really no one knows what's going to happen, and that Marine Harvest Canada does need to be thinking about what this means for their business, their employees, uh, and what changes they might need to do, or what solutions or compromises they might need to bring to the First Nations in the area in order to continue operating. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a fascinating and complex issue. There's there's so many different levels of jurisdiction at play. And um, I, one thing I really appreciate about this this move is that at, at least we're seeing we're seeing some kind of um, action on on the fish farm issue that has, advocates have been calling attention to this for a very long time. And, and there's a lot of concern about declining wild salmon stocks. And so we have to do something about this. This is part of our natural heritage here on the West Coast of Canada. Um, the Cohen Commission was... <laughs> Matthew, tell me about the Cohen Commission. So the Cohen Commission was an inquiry into the decline of sockeye salmon in the Fraser River. And uh, it was a $37 million report. It was the most comprehensive review of Pacific salmon management in uh, Canada. And uh, they, those, uh, those recommendations were tabled in 2012. Uh, since then, 18 of the 20 deadlines established by the report have lapsed without any meaningful or transparent government action. Uh, those 18 lapsed deadlines translate to 13 recommendations that have not been completed out of a total of 14 recommendations. So um, basically, we've been aware of this problem, and the fact that like the next year the most like earth-shattering salmon run occurred uh, right. d doesn't really indicate to me that we should, like should give up and stop doing anything about this. We mm -hmm. should try to clearly we don't understand enough about salmon ecology in the Salish Sea to figure out what what's happening and why some years are bigger than others. And uh, instead of trying to understand understand it more, we've decided, yep, let's just keep this fish in the area because non -non noms But also, like, noms are important because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the salmon stocks are being depleted. So what are we supposed to do? It's very complicated. Very complicated. <laughs> so so is there any response from the, the fish farming question? Are, are they going to start investing in uh, alternative technologies or um, upgrading their facilities to make them um, a little bit better for the environment? So what, what this actually was spurred by was the Marine Harvest decision to restock the Port Elizabeth Salmon Farm. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes at this like sensitive time, and so they, you know, who who employ more than five hundred people and has these working relationships with at least fifteen First Nations uh, and seven First Nations owned businesses as in their supply chain. Um, it is like a, a question as to whether that means free prior and informed consent, which is what the UNDRAP guarantees. Now, Marine Harvest did not respond in the article, mm -hmm. so. Obviously, this will be an evolving issue that will be subject to questions put to the minister in question period and other such interesting things. Right. Um, it, like, it's, it's very complicated, and we'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts on how, how we can, like, maintain the food supply and respect private property and ensure indigenous rights are protected and right. our obligations under international law are upheld and mm -hmm. the environment is preserved because, like, that, that's a very delicate balancing act, and it's all Anna Popham's fault now, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's her fault, but it's uh, all her it's responsibility. Her it's all her responsibility. Right. Yeah, so. yeah, and I, I, th I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's going to be more and more cases like this where we really have to kind of grapple with all of these really, really great offsets. Like, for example, values. the fact that there are fewer and fewer icebergs. Yes, mm -hmm. for example. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Matthew, I think I'm out of political juice. I yes. Just, so I, why don't we sit back and enjoy my interview that I have done tomorrow with Hector Bramner and then we'll see you back in a couple of minutes. Hi there, this is Matthew Naylor. I'm sitting down here with Hector Bremner, the recently victorious city council candidate for the city of Vancouver. Congratulations, Hector. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Rightly or wrongly, the MPA has been perceived as 
uh, somewhat nimbyist, uh, somewhat opposed to some of the uh, like civic or urban reforms that Vision has talked the talk on. How are you going to change that? Well, I think there's two parts, uh, two ans- parts of the answer to that, I guess, is uh, first of all, the real NIMBY party has been actually Vision and the Greens. Mm-hmm. I would argue. I, they have consistently protected and defamily, defended suburban zoning in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. They've aggressively protected and defended car culture through uh, the single family detached home tight network grid. Um, you know, sure, I get it. They say green, 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 uh, solar panel, solar panel, solar panel. But the reality is, is that the only way to really build a green city is actually to build an actual green city. I would argue that if you look at the NPA years of government, the second half of the answer is the NPA years of government over the last 80 years. Those have been the building years. Mm-hmm. It was the years that where the West End was built. Those are the years when Yale Town was built. Those are the years when the Olympic Village was was essentially approved and built. Um, even though the uh, the ribbon cutting was in the the vision years, it was actually mm-hmm. all work done well in advance of them. So the reality is that. Um, MPA has actually been the builder's party. It's actually been the party uh, of building a truly bold and progressive Vancouver. Now, what they have fallen, we have, and we admit this, and I've talked to many people, I think that there, there's a, a mistake or a, a political calculation in talking about bike lanes and, and maybe a trap that, you know, Gregor Robertson and his very uh, crack team of communication specialists were able to uh, exploit was um, the, uh, in their greenwashing effort is to make Gregor Robertson this this green focused environmentalist candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in reality, the NPA built ten times the amount of bike lanes. We just didn't, you know, use it as a political wedge issue. Um, his um, approach uh, has been to be. Um, sort of ostensibly green, but then not really practically be green. And so what we're saying is, is that let's go back to the eco density days. Let's go back to focusing on building housing that middle class working people can afford. Mm-hmm. Um, let's be smarter about how we build. We uh, have to end piecemeal zoning in Vancouver. Uh, we right now have this quilt work, patchwork nonsense throughout the city. Uh, and staff are frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. Builders can't get things done. It takes two years to get a p- permit, which I always have to repeat. It takes two years to get a permit. I mean, I, I think yeah, it, it is beyond it is beyond all uh, reason. So how, how do you how do you think about like how do you think you can bring that time down? Because I think we're getting to the core of the issue here. Uh, how do you build homes? You were very clear that the reason that the rent is high is there is no supply. supply. That's right. Uh, so it's catchy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how do we create that supply? And more importantly, how do we make sure that that supply, which is created, is affordable for the people who are here and who want to come here? There's three factors to affordability. And if you miss any of the three the equation doesn't work. The mm-hmm. first one is type. You have to build the right type of housing. Uh, so based, uh, there's a lot of things that will affect what that right type of housing is, but it's going to be, a, in Vancouver's case, because land costs are so high, it's going to be a multi-residential style. It's going to be a smaller floor plate style. It's not going to be a uh, 30 by 30 lot, uh, single family detached home. This is mm-hmm. not, you know, we, we just can't focus on building on $7 million homes. So type. Uh, and uh, the next part of it is um, volume. Mm-hmm. It is true, and Gregor will try to campaign next year, and he's currently trying to campaign on that he's been adding multi-residential and density. But A, it's the wrong type, and B, they don't build a lot of it. They don't, mm-hmm. they don't actually build a lot of it. It's very, very narrow windows where they allow the density. The third part of it is speed. And what little of the right type that they do allow, they build very, very, very slowly. So the reality, and currently right now, as we're talking right now, according to the UD um, Urban Design Institute, is that there are literally zero new condos of coming on the market in Vancouver today, as we sit here. Like, literally none. Really? Uh, right. So there is... Um, is too slow, it's the wrong type, and what little is of the right type uh, is very little. So my plan contemplates uh, what we call the missing middle approach. Uh, sort of the Jane Jacobs approach too, for those of you who like to like to go onto this. But it is a mixed density style of um, uh, moderated housing uses where you go, um, not towers, and you have to put that out of your mind. I mean, the towers, uh, we should be creating nodes, as I've been calling them. Uh, there should be hubs throughout the city. We should 
should be densifying around um, uh, core areas of, of commerce and uh, transportation. That just makes sense. Um, particularly at our near UBC, we need to be densifying near our SkyTrain stations. We need to be densifying along, um, uh, you know, in Broadway, for example. You've got a strong uh, foundation there for a commercial hub. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is, is that the rest of the neighborhoods are going to benefit from the style of housing where it's going to be things like row homes, town homes, duplexes, interspersing some, you know, mid-level walk-ups or, or, you know, they wouldn't be walk-ups, but mid-level sort of apartment-style buildings. Yeah. Uh, and we, we could afford elevators everywhere. Yeah, yeah, place, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the reality is, is that uh, that's why point number one, and my, you can go to my website, mm -hmm. Hector bremner.com uh if you check that out you can see our housing plan which never changed from the day that we started running in the nomination race to the day that we won the election we never changed a single word we okay. ran on that same platform the whole way through and it's five points and the first one is end piecemeal zoning and have a citywide plan that allows for this type of mid density throughout the entire city and uh, up zone the area uh, in, in the sense that or we, we would call it maybe more accurately pre zone the area mm -hmm. and provide that clarity. Because the biggest reason for the slowdown in the permit department is the lack of clarity in our uh, bylaws uh, because basically everything is done by discretion. So, you know, I equate it like this if for those of you at home have ever worked or run a restaurant, you've been uh, in the restaurant. Now, if the restaurant, if every staff member was focused on one table, mm -hmm. The restaurant wouldn't survive. Yeah. But that's what happens at City Hall in Vancouver. We are sometimes putting all of our resources to talk about one building. One building. So it's time to move past that. Uh, I think staff are ready for it. They're excited to see some new leadership, uh, and they're looking for some direction, and I'm looking forward to uh, giving them some ways to, to actually bring that to life. Now, do you, do you think the actual management of the planning office or understaffing in the planning office has contributed to the delays that have happened? The biggest part of it is a lack of leadership. Okay. Um, staff are basically given uh, resources uh, and tools and direction by those of us that are elected. Um, the current regime who has the majority control has been giving them this direction uh, and giving them these resources, and this is what they've been left with. And I would argue that they are frustrated and they are very disappointed. A former city planner, uh, Brent Totteron, not long ago, I saw him on Twitter do quite a long thread where he was talking. He wasn't naming names, but it was pretty clear what he was talking about, that he was frustrated that his... Um, highly educated, uh, wonderful professionals uh, that he had recruited from around the world to come work in Vancouver, uh, who should be planning cities and building, you know, exciting communities. We're talking about the handrails and window treatments of single-family detached homes. So, you know, there's an enormous <laughs> oh, amount of frustration. Geez. Yeah, no, that's it, very, it's that's yeah, really annoying. It, it is. It's it's frustrating. I mean, you have you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, Rembrandts and Picassos, uh, you know, coloring by numbers because that's what they're being told or given resource to do. So, you know, they're frustrated. Everybody's frustrated and they should be allowed to do uh, what they do best. Um, we should be able to empower staff with clarity of law and clarity of direction and clarity of resources. So uh, we're planning this right now. We're going to be um, uh, doing some um, town halls on these matter. I'm calling them town halls, but uh, UBC is going to be working with us, um, and we're... Uh, so the, uh, the us is you and... My, my set, well, me as yeah. an elected councillor, okay. and I guess uh, and our political party, but, you know, mm -hmm. we, we've been uh, we're going to be hosting some events, and your, uh, your, your listeners will be able to attend these. Um, uh, they'll be at Robson Square, but we are going to be having hosting talks where we're going to be inviting uh, the UDI, Abundant Housing Vancouver, uh, even Gene Swanson. Everybody will be able to come here, and let's have a let's have a discussion of facts because right now, one thing I learned after doing about ten or twelve debates with my uh, um, uh, council uh, candidate colleagues in this by-election was that there is a serious vacuum of fact of what is actually driving the housing crisis, and you can't solve a problem until you really understand what that problem is. And you're just going to end up spending a lot of time treating symptoms than the disease. So what, what role do you see social housing playing? Do you think the city has a role in building social housing itself? Uh, and do you think that uh, what other things, such as the 99-year the lease uh, proposal that you were talking about during the campaign, uh, do you think can be done with city-owned land in order to um, promote the construction of housing for, in particular, low-income people. Okay, so first it's a of big all, question, but, yeah, yeah, no, no. So I'll try to address it in layers. And there's, sure. you know, first of all, uh, when we're talking about, uh, let's start at 
at the most critical, and that is our street entrenched homeless. We have about 3,000, almost 4,000 people uh, that are homeless living on our streets uh, every night. And they live in pretty tough conditions. And they've been living in those tough conditions for many, many years. Street entrenched is usually defined as five years or more living tough. Okay. These are people that are very, very difficult to house because it's not like you can um, put a, a, a rigid structure around them in terms of rules. It's not like, uh, and you know, often uh, housing is barriered by these rules where, you know, you have to be here, you have to do this, and you have to be clean, and you have to, you know, like all these kind of things. And it just doesn't work. Like They, they mm-hmm. are just not used to this, and they are not uh, accustomed to this. So we need to, first of all, invest in a big way and work with the province in a uh, meaningful way, as other municipalities have, uh, to go all in on no-barrier housing. So it's called Housing First. It's about it's a specific style of um, assisted uh, housing. So the uh, Utah model, like that. Yeah, well, it has been done in here locally. I mean, you can mm-hmm. go ten SkyTrain stops away from here in New Westminster, and where they've effectively ended street homelessness. Nobody, there okay. are no street entrenched homeless people in New Westminster anymore. When there used to be over 130, um, the reason why was is that the same dynamic that Gregor Robertson says that you know prevented him from doing his job over the last ten years, uh, which was a NDP local government and a then BC liberal provincial government but somehow uh, deep deep orange territory of New Westminster was able to work with a BC Liberal government uh, and uh, build several no barrier units, uh, expropriate uh, some properties that were um, owned by gangs being used to run uh, prostitution, all the rest of it. And they were able to convert this into high quality housing for people that gets them indoors, stabilizes them. Usually it's 24 months that they can stay there, basically, no questions asked. Um, you know, it, they're flexible in the rules, the bylaws are eased in terms of smoking within the building, um, pets. Um, there's a giant sauna in the basement, basically, which you can roll uh, the carts and other people. There's their things when they first arrive into the sauna, and it deep bed bugs them. Oh. And uh, it actually has a um, you know, storage capacity in the basement. So, you know, on day one, that those all those things I just mentioned are barriers because currently they say, well, you know, you have to be, we'll put your name on a list if you've been able to stay clean on the streets for 90 days, which of course is not going to happen. Yeah, okay. And then uh, then the next thing is, is you show up with your stuff and your stuff is maybe has bed bugs or is dirty or and it's just like, you know, a person with mental health issues might be holding on to things that, you know, to you and me would not seem rational to hold on to. But to them, it's their things. And so then they have this argument with them on day one and they're like, we're going to throw away your stuff. And then they're like, you're not going to throw away my stuff. And it's another barrier. You don't have the, the right to tell people what is you know, important. But, but this, <laughs> this, this is the argument that happens. And then mm-hmm. their, their pets, you know, their pets are, um, you know, just as important to them as they are to you. And, uh, you know, they're told, well, you know, you can't have your pets here, so you're going to have to put them in, you know, a facility. And so, you know, all of these things keep people in the streets. So I, it was very important to me, to me to take this moment to talk about this issue because okay. we have to go all in, no barrier housing. We can truly get people off the streets uh, when we actually invest in this model. It's not subjective. It's not up for debate. It's not, a, it's not like I'm, I'm making this up. This has worked. It's worked in the lower mainland, and it's working around the world, and we need to do it now. So the, the market doesn't create that type of housing. Though. It does not. So then you know, we get into the next tier, which are the working poor and the vulnerable. And sometimes these are people on fixed incomes, like seniors, who make mm-hmm. up one of the fastest growing demographics of homeless uh, in our current homeless count. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the last three years. And the reason why is is that um, low-cost uh, rental is being uh, harvested and replaced uh, or is being um, squeezed out basically by uh, the fact that the market is so constrained on supply that, uh, for example, a, a, a basement suite in East Vancouver uh, at the beginning of Gregor Robertson's uh, last term here um, was uh, $700 a month. Mm-hmm. Today it's about $1,700 a month. Uh, a one-bedroom apartment for the regular person listening here, uh, who is even making half decent money, is gone up now to around two thousand dollars, maybe even higher as, as twenty-one hundred dollars, according to some recent numbers. So the reality is, is that we have constrained supply uh, mm-hmm. to the point where you know, as long as you've got twenty people fighting over one t- chair, that chair is going to be very expensive mm-hmm. uh, when it comes time to sit down. So the reality is, is that seniors are being squeezed out, low income working working low income people are being squeezed out. And they, you know, maybe were on the margins and they were on the on the edge, but typically hadn't experienced homelessness, but now they are actually being squeezed out by this crisis. And so how we address that is in two specific ways. One, um, we add more supply. So mm-hmm. there's very right. sp- specific ways that we can encourage the building of rental. 
I think every developer, big and small, has said they are willing to build and operate rental at market rates in the city if they were allowed. But the reality is, is that due to the punitive tax and fee structure um, and the zoning restrictions, it makes it impossible to actually build it. And so uh, we have to address that immediately, and I have a plan to do that. Second thing is uh, us- utilizing, in a non-market way, City land. We own billions of dollars in land across the city, and Mr. Robertson and uh, Mr. Horgan recently announced a, a plan to build, uh, you know, a few units in modular housing, and you know, it's temporary and all this stuff. But my my plan contemplates actually a model that works in Europe, and works in Asia, and it works in the United States. And you basically take city-owned property. Mm-hmm. You already bought it. You bought it probably for some other reason 30 years ago, and you know governments tend to acquire property. Maybe they were going to build a park. Maybe they were going to build a school, but you know whatever the plan fell through in the land has just been held in a, in a uh, asset holdings. And so uh, what we do is we take this property, and we do a $1.99 year lease with a builder. Mm-hmm. And what you have now is an opportunity where you've taken the most uh, costly aspect of the capital expenditures of building, which is the land in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. And now all you have is the building expense, which is actually quite low. So what you do now is, um, depending on the property, uh, predominantly though, you'd be able to build market and non-market at the same time. Mm-hmm. So for example, what you'd be able to do is say, if the, if the property only fits one building, um, 40 story building, for example, in the downtown core, the first 20 units are uh, owned by the city and kept in a, a land trust, essentially, mm-hmm. and rented out based on an income test means, for example. Um, uh, most commonly uh, used number is 30% of people's um, gross income. So, uh, so, so this, is, this is a model that uh, is generally accepted, but you know, depending on what, what the circumstances are, but you have some flexibility. And then the, ta- or, and then the rest of the building, um, for example, could be uh, rented at market or even sold. So um, that uh, cost, though, is borne by... Uh, the developer and the city would be able to then have this asset built for them essentially at no cost and ensure both market and non-market is being put on um, uh, the the spectrum and people uh, are having access to that volume and the right type at the right speed. So this is uh, a critical measure Uh, and if we were able to do those two things successfully and again modernizing, I would call it, our zoning to allow more rental uh, and more density while also using uh, the non-market uh, ratio of, of um, uh, using city, city land that we own already uh, and using this proven model of adding um, what would ultimately be tens of thousands of permanent union units rather um, uh, on a 99-year basis, which is three generations. That would ensure three generations of um, certitude in, in housing. They talk about housing like the Americans talk about healthcare. Uh, it's like it's never been figured out before. Like nobody's ever figured out that the single payer is the way. Well, density is the way. There's two things that the numbers agree with. We have, um, uh, you know, climate change is real, and that uh, we have a supply crisis in Vancouver. And I can't explain it to you any simpler than that. We three who do the podcast spend a lot of time thinking about politics, and uh, so do many of our listeners. So. We like to take a little bit of uh, a moment at the end of each show to ask, what else have you been thinking about? (laughs) So, uh, Hector, what else have you been thinking about? Uh, You know, I know that you've been running for office uh, for the last little while, but has there been anything else on your plate that's been keeping you busy? Uh, You know, I think it's just been, um, you know, coming off running this campaign, it's been truly exceptional. I've been so uh, blessed. And, uh, you know, I'm just... I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what it what it means to actually have been selected by your peers to to do something like this, and um, you know, it's been a, a real overwhelming experience, and um, you know, I'm I'm uh, still on the high of it all. It's still not maybe totally real. Slowly, slowly yeah. sinking <laughs> in and being real. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm just so excited that I've had this opportunity and. Um, you know, I've just been thinking a lot about our family and what um, an honor it is for our family. You know, everyone in our family has just you know, been 110% behind me. And it's, you know, it's just so excited that, you know, uh, we get us. My wife is originally from the Philippines. And, you know, they are just, you know, so excited that, you know, as an immigrant family that, you know, came here, struggled, uh, came up, worked hard, and are, I think, the backbone of Vancouver, uh, the, the type of people that are the backbone of Vancouver, 
um, and what it means to be able to give them a voice and to be able to contribute uh, on their behalf. And uh, it's, it's, been, it's been really overwhelming. So I've been spending a lot of time thinking about that and making sure that uh, I'm worth it uh, and I'm worthy of all this. Excellent. Well, Hector, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. It was my pleasure entirely. All right, then. Well, we will follow your uh, doings on City Council uh, closely. Please do. I myself have been thinking about some of the things that I've been doing on this road trip. I hiked Emerald Lake and Lake Louise, uh, which are both easy but beautiful hikes up in the national parks, and have been enjoying my time in Calgary. I will be back next week with another episode with Pat and Aaron, and look forward to talking to you all then. The full and unedited interview with Hector Brentner will be out in a couple of days. Yes, actually, a couple of days. It's already prepared for your listening pleasure. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you have comments or suggestions, you should follow us on social media. We are available on Facebook and on Twitter at PodKeepOurLand, uh, as well as our email at PodKeepOurLand at gmail.com. From Calgary, Alberta, temporarily, I'm Matthew Naylor. Have a great week.